to the speakers for today. Brenda Gunderson is a senior lecturer in the statistics department, and she coordinates and teaches the largest course on campus, STATS 250. And Omar Chavez is a graduate student at UT Austin. He recently uh, received his master's degree in statistics from the University of Michigan. Thank you both. All right. So thank you for letting us come and share the STATS 250 eCoach story. Um, earlier this week, I got an email from a colleague, and it was a link to the field guide to data science. And looked through it a little bit. There was a forward that said, every aspect of our lives, from life-saving disease treatments to national security, to economic stability, and even the convenience of selecting a restaurant, can be improved by creating better data analytics through data science. I think they left off, though, an important area, right? Mm -hmm. like education, personalized education in particular. So we'll add that to the list because we have been doing some amazing things here at U of M. Lots of people involved in that process and lots of possibilities in the future yet too. So we're going to share a little bit about what eCoach is and what we've been doing on the eCoach project in STATS 250. Give you some examples of what the students have experienced by being part of the eCoach system over the last couple semesters. A few things that we did try to change and improve on between fall and, win and winter term. Some general feedback from me, but then we turn it over to Omar, the player of the data, and giving us the results of our estimating the effect of eCoach on performance for students. We'll share with you briefly at the end uh, what the current status is of how eCoach is being used in our course right now still, and some learning that we gathered from the spring term experience. All right, questions are welcome throughout. If you do have them, please raise your hand, and if not, we'll certainly try to have time at the end to address them too. So e-coach, the two e's for electronic and expert, right? I think what we've heard Tim in a lot of his talks say that was the hook for me that is going to allow us to say what we would like to say to every student if we could have them each come in and sit down with us for some individual office hours or expert coaching. And Tim's not here today. He said he was not going to be able to make it, but I thought we should listen to Tim for just a minute. So we actually have a video. This video was put together and put out there in December in between the fall and winter term that actually highlights the e-coach as it was being done this last year in the various STEM disciplines. So I'm going to pull it up from YouTube to play it for you. So you can listen a little bit. Here, Tim, here, Jared, and a few of the actual students who experienced it. I think eCoach is directly responsible for my success in the course. I'm not really a math-minded person. I just, I have to take this class for my major. I was really surprised actually when I finished signing up. There's literally a little bar on the side that told me exactly what I needed to do in order to, I guess, be successful in the class. What eCoach allows us to do is to sit down and think about what we would say to all of those students if they came and sat with us? What would I say to a student who says, I'm not a physics person? What would I say to a student who says, I want to become an astrophysicist? And this technology allows us to write down what it is we would say to these students, feed it into a system which then looks at who are these students, what are their properties, and it decides what, should, what, what we should say to the students and actually delivers personalized messages to every one of the 700 students who's in the class. We did a bunch of stuff with asking them about what's important to them and what goals do they have for the class. So they log into their eCoach page and after they've completed a couple surveys way up front so that we get to know who they are and what their goals are, they have a standard home page that they come to. And I think that's one of my favorite parts because on the front page for their home page is a get things done list. So we set it up to say if you want to succeed in the class, if we can help you do better in the course, here are the things that we would lay out and have you work on. The practice exams are the most useful and eCoach has a collection of I think like 50 practice questions from old exams per chapter. I found those incredibly helpful. We have a problem roulette tool on, on the biochemistry um, uh, eCoach application that allows them to see questions that are specific for each chapter that address the level of detail that they have to know, address points that are probably more difficult for many students to learn than, than others, and so it helps them identify real goals for them. I've been teaching for a significant number of years, and I've, I find it very rewarding to be able to know that students understand a difficult concept. I've been using eCoach to basically plan my studies for general chemistry. It's a huge class, about 1,300, 1,400 students. 
I've been using it to keep up on the readings, prepare for tests, know where I am in terms of grade, I can type in my own percentages. Probably the hardest part about transversing from high school to college was um, knowing what to do and when. Need Coach really set that up for you. You should read tonight, you should do the a couple of homework problems tonight. And uh, it's really helped and I feel like as a student who uses it over students who don't, I definitely have an advantage. Did you hear that last line? Do I need to play that last line again? Tonight, you should do the couple of homework problems tonight. And uh, it's really helped and I feel like as a student who uses it over students who don't, I definitely have an advantage. <laughs> And so Omar is going to later show what that advantage is, the analysis from that. All right. So a quick intro to eCoach. Oops, we're off here. So this is a slide that's typically in explaining how it works. I'm not going to go into those details at all. But it does take a team, a team of people on the eCoach stats team were invaluable to making this work for our students. So I've got those students or people listed here. There's a lot that goes into uh, that Michigan tailoring system and the workbench that was used to deliver the content, a lot more than what I'm going to be sharing today. But part of the reason why we have a new version of eCoach called EZ Coach that is coming out and being better. All right, so we're bringing these individual personalized messages to our students. They were available in the various STEM classes over the fall and winter term. This is the landing page that students would go to and then they would click on which class they're in and go to their coach for that particular discipline. And that's that 250 class. It is, is it the largest class on campus? That's what I've been told. Okay. 1,700 students enrolled in the course. Um, they come to a lecture with two to 400 students sitting there and learning three hours a week. They go to a lab once a week with 30 students and most of them are sophomores, quite a few are freshmen, so these are the undergrads or under um, class students that are coming in from high school experience and a lot of them are there because they have to take the course, not that they wanted to. And we're trying to be able to reach out to them, all 1,700 students. Certainly couldn't do that in person, but can I still do it in some way through eCoach? Did they participate? They did. We had total voluntary enrollment. They did not have to sign up for eCoach. It was not part of their letter grade that they would earn points by doing so. But we had about an 80% enrollment into the eCoach system. To do so, they had to complete two surveys. One was a general survey and one was stat specific. And a couple of our grad students came up with a really cool low-end video that they pretended to be students signing up for eCoach and what would be the purpose and the perks. And we ran that in our classrooms over that second week or so of class. And that really did kind of spike up the students who signed up to enroll. Now, once you enroll, you still have to use the system. And so we'll talk a little bit about this usage levels and things too. We tailored on a lot of aspects about what the course was, its structure, things that we got from how they're doing in the course through the grade book. Uh, the survey that we had at the beginning of the term asked things about their desired grade and you know what kind of effort were they planning to put into the course. And in statistics, we did do a few other areas of gathering some data. We did a learning styles survey that we asked. We did it at the end of the fall term and then found that it was some useful information. So we put it at the beginning of the winter term and even had some tailoring on their learning styles in an exam prep message later. We gathered information on what resources they were using throughout the course. So what were you using to get ready for that exam? And then we even brought this into a homework question to weekly ask them, what resources are you using to master this content? And we also asked them how much sleep they're getting. Because right? sleep has an important role in how well they perform. So we recorded that. We, partway through the term, gave them some results on how exam one turned out for those who had a low amount of sleep on average versus a high amount of sleep on average. Reported what they had been reporting to say, which group are you in? and get them to think a little bit about that. Sometimes sending them to an external link, like to a TED Talk that talked about sleep and its importance to guide them in you know, their health area too and being ready for that exam. My favorite was the Get Things Done list. So I was doing this before eCoach. I was sending it to them in a C-Tools announcement. It was just a you know, PDF paper form. But within eCoach, we were able to have it on their landing page for statistics. It's the front thing that they saw every time going to the coach. The boxes for each item that they had to do were clickable. So they could actually check the box with an e-coach. And if it said, okay, go and finish up that homework 10 that's required, the homework 10 link took them to the homework tool to get that 
task done right away. So what was actionable here could actually go on and take that action right away from the list. The landing page also had a calendar down in the corner, which they could incorporate into the Google Calendar with all the deadlines and dates. Had a little statement of a fact about statistics. Did you know? Often tying into something that was happening here at U of M. And you're seeing a snapshot at the end of the term. So there's quite a list of messages that are on the left-hand side here in their eCoach inbox that they had been receiving over the course of the term. Those messages were lots of varieties. They were welcome messages at the beginning with some general tips. How are you doing along the way? Some progress messages, homework, office hours, um, attending lab, preparing for those exams, two semester exams, so a pre and a post and letting them reflect on that. Had a couple tools that were embedded within eCoach, so we sent them to that to try, get that productive struggle and practice at the content. And of course, some surveys done prior to the signing up for eCoach, but also at the end of the term for some feedback. So a couple snapshots of what some of those messages really did look like. This was one that we sent out after they were given the opportunity to do a practice homework. So we use a homework system, lecture book, and we want them to practice that system first. So we give them a practice homework. It doesn't count to the grade, but if they do it, it gets graded. And we can report, oh, it looks like you did that homework. Great job. And you did pretty well on the score. Or you did it, but you scored kind of low. Or you didn't do it, but that's OK. It's not going to count towards your final grade. But here are some things where students have often missed points on a homework. Or matching to that person receiving this message an image of student voice. Someone in the past who had some comments about homework tips and implementing good homework techniques and providing that message to them. Also, we provide them their own data. So we could give them data on current students or past students and allow them to do some further analysis too, taking out all of the identifiers, of course. But we provided them on how students performed on exam one based on whether they have been doing their homework or not or scoring well on the homework. <laughs> sending them to the link that had the data set so that they could work on that some more or incorporate a homework question using their actual data rather than some other generic data set that they might not relate to as well. Reminders, homeworks or exams coming up, get ready for that exam, where do you go, what do you bring? Again, direct links within the messages that would send them to the review questions so they could print them out right there. Oh, I'm supposed to bring that to that review or the different resources that they have available reminding them of that. This was also a message where we brought back the learning styles. So when we had their learning style survey done up front, we could actually incorporate some advice based on those learning styles within this message that was attuned to what kind of learner they were and give them that individual ideas. They loved the exam results message, right? How am I doing in the course? So giving them some idea of what they performed at and the overall course distribution. Reminding them if they aren't quite meeting that goal grade that they gave us at the beginning of the term. Now, what are some things they might do to change that? Did they perform better or worse than their exam one? And reminding them how the course structure is set up so they have still the opportunity to pick up from where they are here and continue to move forward and do better. We gave them prediction models. This is a grade prediction model. So if there were students just like you in the past who were at your level, this is what kind of grades they earned at the end of the term. So here are the predicted grades for you at this point, if you decide not to do anything different, changing how you prepare or study for exams. So we gave them a grade distribution, and they could see whether they were going to possibly get that A minus grade that they wanted to get. It's possible, but not as likely as a B or as a C. So each person had their own individual predicted grade distribution to help them decide of what they might want to start doing now to continue to move forward and do better in the course. I think one of their favorites was the grade calculator. Who doesn't want to be able to figure out what grade they've got right now, right? And our course has a straight scale so that they're able to actually work out their grade with it populating the scores they already have and letting them play around with the scores that they have yet to earn so they can see and compare method one versus method two. Which one am I going to end up wanting to use, which would use the, the best one for them, and how well do I have to perform on that next exam to be able to start to attain that grade that I'd like. We asked them, what would you want to tell yourself before that next exam, based on what you learned after taking exam one? Give us the time to reflect and tell us what you'd like us to feed back to you in a future message, personally. 
and they said they would go to office hours more. Hmm. They would do at least one stats problem every day. That's a good idea. Um, they would start studying at least a week in advance. Don't wait to the last minute. Or, bolded the last one here, set aside specific blocks of time to prepare for that exam two weeks prior, which kind of ties into another area of research that we're looking at from this last spring term that's leading into fall changes this term. So more on that later. The tools that we gave them that were available for practicing some of the elements of statistics and what they had to know. Name that scenario was one of them and problem roulette. They were available right within the system, but any student in the course could go to them and use them. So they weren't only within the system, but just convenient there. Along with the message that was sent to remind them they had that tool to use and why it would be a useful one and what data we have on students who use it did it indeed perform better. So the name that scenario is one of them where they could take the researcher's question and what variables were being measured and match it to what statistical technique or tool they might use to address it with feedback. And the problem roulette, which you heard a little bit about in the video, that was another tool. We had to convert all of our exam questions to be multiple choice ones because ours are not multiple choice, but they're now in problem roulette and students can go try out anywhere they'd like questions from past exams for whatever topics are of maybe more important for them to practice. And we did incorporate in ours some video solutions. So if they were having trouble with why they got the answer wrong, they could actually click and see a video solution of that particular part of that question, explaining it to them and guiding them through. We had po uh, posters up that advertise problem light. You can do it anywhere, on your phone, on the bus. That was fun. And what did the students like about eCoach? The best things that came up were the practice, even though that was available to them outside of eCoach, they still liked having them right there for review tools. The grade prediction. I liked that grade updates to see my progress and how I needed to adjust my study habits. And that's what we wanted them to do, to get that personal feedback and be able to see how they wanted to adjust what they were doing. Awesome to have that information about how I'm doing in the class. And then the reminders, the get things done list that kept them on track for things. A lot of students said they didn't want to change anything, but also they wanted more in the terms of having pop-up reminders you know, for those different dates and times, rather than just once a week, that out there. But we also wanted to take a look at all this data that we're gathering and what we're learning from our students and figure out, does eCoach really help the students? What did we change from fall to winter term? Well, we were curious as to whether it's that tailoring that's really doing the work here, the personalization. I mean, in the health fields, they've lots and lots of data out there to show that it is that level of personalization that's helping to change that health behavior, that behavior in the person. Is that what we're having happen here? So we did put together a controlled experiment with respect to the tailoring level and implemented it quite quickly in the winter term. Students signed up then and they either received high level tailored messages or low level table tailored messages. And the high ones had personalization in it on the information we gathered from them, the law was just the basic information, the basic content. Here's an example of the high level message. They had their name. We reported on their lab attendance. We matched them with advice. They had a student voice giving them information that was matched by various characteristics. And they had their own GSI right there as a picture, talking to them and reminding them about their lab attendance being important. For the low level group, they still got the same basic content in the message, but there was no name and there was no reporting of what they were actually doing to help them think about that. No match student advice and just, you know, yes, you need to go to lab and if you miss one, make it up. So this is probably one of the messages that showed a little bit more of that distinction between the high and low group. Some of them were not as able to make that distinction quite as strong, I don't think. We're still learning how to write these messages. We did do some comparisons with an analysis similar to what Omar will be describing on the full data analysis that he'll be sharing, but we didn't find any significant difference in course grade. We're still new at this though. We were still learning what students are gonna be sensitive to, what part of that personalization they're going to you know, connect with or react to, and you know, we just had one semester of data on this and really aren't being able to tease out that effect. It might be a small effect, we just weren't able to detect it, but it wasn't the right direction descriptively. So with that, we're gonna look at a lot of data analysis now of the full fall and winter term results to tease out that effect of eCoach. And we'll turn that over to Omar, 
He's got to give us some definitions of what we're going to be hearing for terms and show us how we've worked through estimating this average treatment effect, the e-coach effect, both with those students that registered and also looking at a comparison with those who did not sign up for the system. So I'll leave it over to Omar. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor. OK. So um, the definitions that I'm going to go over are sort of wanted to actually talk briefly about the types of words or phrases you're going to be hearing me say, because uh, they're sort of key to the way I, uh, they're, they're key conceptually to the uh, estimates I was trying to, tend, trying to get at. So we have e-coach registered students, right? We have usage ratio, which is the metric that we came up with to measure their uh, usage level, uh, how much they use e-coach. And then we split them into groups, so low, medium, and high. So these, these things are, are uh, important in, in terms of the analysis. And then the actual technical side of it is uh, we use something called the propensity score uh, for doing matching with students. And we also use something called the prognostic score, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And then the actual matching technique uh, is full match. Uh, is developed by one of the statisticians here, Ben Hansen. And then our response variable, whenever, we hear, whenever you hear me say response variable, really what I mean is the final course grade, which is that's what we're interested in measuring. OK, so let's see. The outline of the analysis, the first thing we have to do is identify a treatment group and then also a control group. Because right? so we have to make comparison between people who use DQH at some level and then uh, how they compare to a, another group of people who use it at a different level. And then we estimate the propensity score for the comparison for the groups that were for who the comparisons were making. And then we also estimate the prognostic score. And then uh, we calculated the similarity matrix uh, using Mahalanobis distance. And I'll explain a little bit later why the Mahalanobis distance was important to use rather than uh, Euclidean, which is what we typically think of when we talk about distance. And then uh, we find a, a match. In this case, we used a full match. Um, and we used restrictions to make sure that we got people who are more or less similar enough in terms of their likeliness to use eCoach. So that was the restriction that we put on the matching. Uh, it was an R package that uh, allows us to basically do these matching. It's called OptiMatch, uh, also developed by Ben Hinton here. And then we estimate the average treatment effect. And so the package that we used for that one was called XBalance, which is also written by Ben Hinton. He's really good at this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let's see. OK, so selecting groups. So we split the students into four groups, right? Uh, the first one is the non-eCoach registered students, so people that don't use eCoach. And then we have people that use eCoach at various levels, so low, medium, and high. And um, it's just important to notice that the low, medium, and high groups are the ones that actually used eCoach, or in terms of they actually registered for eCoach. So yeah. So who are the people in the groups, right? So the eCoach registered students are all the students uh, that completed the required eCoach common survey, so people register for eCoach or they, they sign into eCoach for the first time, if they've, they could be in other classes that also use eCoach, so they all get this, this common survey, right? And it, all of the eCoaches share the information that's provided there. And then uh, you typically, at least in statistics, you do another survey that's specific to the course, so we get information about how uh, motivated they are for that particular subject and how much they plan to study for that particular subject. Um, and so both of these together are required, and if you complete both of these, then you become officially, quote, uh, registered in terms of our perspective. Then um, these are the students that are also eligible to receive messages, uh, the other students or not. Okay, so the non-eCoach registered students, uh, those are the students that did not complete the surveys, and they were the ones that were not eligible to receive messages. Okay, so we selected these high, medium, and low level usage groups uh, by the number of messages that they read. So that was the way we decided to uh, characterize them. So we uh, defined something called the usage ratio. It's going to be abbreviated UR. Uh, and that, uh, that's the number of messages that they clicked on and opened and looked at. Uh, well, we don't know if they looked at them, but you know, if they do it enough, it's, we, the assumption is that they're reading the messages. And then we divide it by the total number of messages that got released to, to that particular student. So for example, if there's a student named Mike, and they returned 13 messages, and there's 23 that were released over the course of the semester to Mike, then we're going to say that his usage ratio was um, 13 over 23. OK, so the cutoff that we identified, uh, we did it by quantile. And so we basically took uh, the usage ratio numbers, the entire distribution of usage ratios for the population of students for that particular semester. And then we made a cut at the bottom third and a cut at the upper third. And so that's how the three groups were defined. So it was quantile one third and quantile uh, two thirds. 
It was this agnostic about when, so it doesn't identify the people who read all the messages early and none of the messages later versus the people who maybe read a couple and then realized they were useful and started reading them all. So, so the messages are released sequentially throughout the semester right. um, in a time, like, uh, whenever it becomes, that yeah. content becomes re relevant. So uh, you're saying... I might be a student who reads all, every time I get a message in the first few weeks I read it, yeah. so I have a 100% usage ratio, but then either I'm doing really well or I decide the system is bogus mm -hmm. and I stop reading them, then I'm going to look like a 0.5 person, which may be very different than someone who gets the first couple messages and doesn't really realize they should open them and only starts hearing from other students, you know, did you read your messages? Mm -hmm. these, are, these are really useful. And then I start reading them all. Um, so we would have the same 0.56 score. So you, if you, so yeah, so if you read the first 13 and someone read the last 13, um, they would have the same 0.56 yeah. score. The yeah. The denominator though is, is all, all the messages that showed up. Yes, of course. In the entire yeah. semester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm just asking, you know, something yeah. to think about for the future. Obviously. Yes. Yeah. So so um, they would have the same number. That's right. true. Okay. Just a clarification question. So students got different numbers of messages, or did all the students? So, um, so in the first semester, uh, fall 13, they all had the same number of messages. And then in the winter 14 term, there was the high and low tailoring that we the professor mentioned earlier. And the low tailor group had less messages in their inbox than the high tailor group. So to sort of put them on the same scale, that's why we did the usage ratio. Cool. Anyone else? Okay. Right. So the actual cutoffs for the fall term were... Uh, these intervals. So the low, low, usage, low usage ratio group was, you know, zero to about a third. The middle was basically uh, bottom third to about a little bit over half of the messages released. And then anyone that read more than, you know, 0.545 messages was considered a high user that particular semester. But then in the winter term, uh, you can see how the distribution changes slightly. And so the way this actually looks um, in the distribution is, is, is here. So basically, Let's see. It's like more people here are sort of only reading a few of the messages, and then we can see that the distribution sort of like shifts more to the right, more or less, in terms of uh, median usage. So um, that's that's kind of interesting. But the 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 messages seemed like the the content since it was developing, maybe people got more engaged, and so we're not really sure exactly why this happened. But um, it could also just be you know noise, also. So you know when we get more data this semester, we'll sort of see like you know better. I have a better idea what's going really on. Um, okay, then the actual comparisons that we made. So uh, the comparisons are always pairwise, right? Because we're trying to build these uh, mat, uh, these uh, these pairs where we match individuals, and so uh, we control we compare the high and the medium group, the high and the low group, and then the high and the non-registered, and like all of the pairwise comparisons that you can go from there. Um, so uh, six total. So <laughs> why can't we just do a simple t-test, right? Like. That's, that's, I guess that makes sense. So the, the, the fundamental thing here is that um, if we just do that, we don't really know that the baseline covariates that are characteristic of, say, like the high group and like the non-registered group are fundamentally different in some way. And if we just do a simple t-test, we don't know if it's the e-coach usage that's causing this estimated difference that we're, that we're seeing or if there's actually something else that's sort of underlying that we are not comparing directly that's causing the, the change, uh, the observed change in their grades. So um, we move on to matching, right? Oh, actually, I want to say one more thing. So typically, another thing, let me see. Yeah, so another thing we might think of doing is like a regression or something like that. But there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, problems that can sort of sneak into the analysis in terms of biasing your estimates if you just do a straight regression like um, we would normally think of doing. And so in order to be able to sort of uh, eliminate as much bias as possible, um, it seems, at least to me from all the literature that I've that I've come across is to, you want to find people who are almost identical in every way that you can possibly measure. And if you're um, really clever in all the data that you get, you can get a really good estimate in the effect you're trying to look for. Um, which is why regression doesn't really help you with that because um, you don't know that, say, for example, that there are uh, people with low usage ratios who also have low GPAs that are being put into this model that you're building that have high GPAs and also have high usage ratios and sort of like you can you can be sort of fooled into thinking that it's the usage ratio but it really is like a GPA kind of thing. So to deal with that we do matching. Yes. So this might be a question for Brenda, but was was the use of e coach promoted at all in class like in lecture? <coughs> so the usage could reflect attendance as well? 
It could. We promoted it in many places, sent an out, sending out C-Tools announcements, so all students got that, even if they were not coming to class. Students could watch the lectures that were captured through Blue Review, so they could still get that information. GSIs were sending out messages as reminders and saying, hey guys, have you signed up for eCoach yet? You know, so there was multiple places where they were getting the message that this was available, mostly over the beginning of the term. You know, we didn't keep harping on them, but like when we put in a new tool, or now the grade calculator is there, we got a little bump again after exam one for people who jumped up and signed up because they wanted to have those tools available. So people could choose to not register initially, but then go back and register. It was open throughout the whole term, yep. So as a general rule when it comes to matching, uh, especially when you want to measure the uh, treatment effects, uh, you want to only use data that was available at the beginning of the term, um, or at least something that you could have known at the beginning of, ter of the term, even if you're collecting the data later. And so the reason is that you don't really know for sure that this treatment that you're sort of administering to people, if it's going to basically change in s their, their measured covariates in some way, that also will have an impact on what you were trying to estimate, uh, which is their grades. And so because of that, we just basically stay away from the data that is collected over the course of the term, unless it was something that was not going to change over the course of the term, like for example, or sex or something like that. Um, or, there, or the GPA at the beginning of the term, right? Okay, and so uh, there's a, like a reference here that if you want to go read about you know, how people have, have managed to say you know, what variables are important in terms of estimating effects when it comes to um, uh, matching, matching uh, yeah, matching analysis. Sorry, um, this, is a good, some, this is a good article to read. Okay, so students that register give us lots of data, which is fantastic, and then students that don't register, they give us much less data. And basically, the data that we have on them is available through the Michigan University of Michigan Data Warehouse. Uh, useful, but not as much. So um, the data that's available for all students, it's the academic level their grade based or their like a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior level. Uh, we have this uh, learning style survey that we actually gave to all the students uh, for extra credit, a couple of points for completing the survey so we can get some idea about the kind of learners that they were. And then uh, we have their GPA and we also have their gender. So then for the people that choose to register for eCoach, we have a lot more data. And so the really important ones are uh, sort of this one and their confidence and uh, how much they uh, like the subject and questions like that, which become useful in uh, estimating their grades and how much they're going to use eCoach later. But a lot of a lot of different variables, and I'll highlight the ones that are actually relevant uh, for propensity matching and also for the prognostic scores. So um, the next question somebody might have is like, why not uh, match on the covariates directly? Um, and so, because we have a lot of data, there's uh, this problem with this high dimensionality issue where you want to, uh, the distances start to become sort of meaningless when there's lots of data. And so what we do is we collect, take the data and we collapse it into a, a, a couple of scalars. And so in doing so, then we're able to collect, uh, compare more directly students um, in a, I think, a more meaningful way when it comes to actually measuring distance between them. So let's see, so we have the propensity score. And so if you're not familiar with what a propensity score is, it's, a, it's an estimate of the probability that a, per a person, a student in this case, is going to uh, elect to be part of the treatment group because they're sort of self-selecting to be part of, of, the, um, of the treatment. And then there is another number that we use called the prognostic score. And so it's similar to the propensity score. It's calculated a little bit differently. But in our case, it's an estimate of their grade at the end of the term. OK, so one key thing, I think, is that we use the same data set to build a propensity score and a prognostic score. And so it's like, well, why would you do that, right? Because you just use, you're just basically recycling the data. But I think the key thing to, take, to notice is that propensity scores have a tendency, tendency at least for our particular, um, uh, what, what we're modeling, which is the, do they use eCoach or not? And then also, what's their grade going to be? Is that those two numbers emphasize the data, the attributes of the data differently. So um, I'll, go, I'll have a list of things that are important for propensity score matching and then another list that's good for uh, estimating their, their course grade. And you'll see that there's some overlap, but it's not, that's not a perfect overlap. OK, so here's what I, where I say um, a little bit about propensity scores, right? So I'm like, why we want to use them. So suppose we have a subject. We're going to call him TI. That's a person in the treatment group. And then they have a response. We're going to call it G of TI, right, which is the final course grade. And then. Um, there's a subject, we're going to call them CJ because they're in the control group. 
and they're indexed differently. Right? And so they have a response, G of CJ, and that's also their final course grade. And so we're also going to assume that TI and CJ have the same propensity score, and so the notation I'm going to use is PROP of X, so it's like a function for propensity score. And then we're going to also assume that there's no confounding variables, which I realize is a heavy assumption, but if you have a really large data set, um, you sort of uh, are able to capture a large, a large amount of information about the person. And so uh, with that, the, if there are confounding variables, they start to have less and less effect on your estimate. So more data, more data is better, is, is the idea. Okay, so under these assumptions, um, the estimated difference in their final course grades on average is going to be in a biased estimator of the treatment effect, which is really, really nice because that's what we want to find out, right? Okay, so one thing about, so we use the largest complete set of variables available. So what that really means is that when we're doing comparisons to the, the non eco registered students, Earlier I had, there was a list of variables that was available for all students, and we said we were only able to use those, those small number of variables. But the estimates we make uh, for two groups that are both registered, we have a lot more data. So I think that those estimates probably are a little bit more reliable in, in terms of like how well we're able to match students together. Um, but uh, you know, both comparisons I think are, are still pretty good because there is you know, reasonable uh, covariates that we're using to match on. So let's see. So how to calculate a propensity score, right? So first we have to identify treatment in a control group. And those are the ones we're going to compare. Then we have to label them in the data because it doesn't actually come, like the data set doesn't have like, you know, treatment and then control. So we have to actually put that into the data set and we, we decide who's the treatment and who's the control. And so like I was saying earlier is that you can, you sort of arbitrarily choose who the treatment group is going to be and like where you're going to cut, cut off. Like from this, from this metric forward, we're going to consider these people users, and this, from this metric backwards, we're going to consider them non-users. So you, you want to kind of play around with like this number, but basically um, it's, it's something that you decide. And so then you build, you build a model that estimates the probability that a particular subject falls into the treatment group. And so we use random forest uh, classifiers, but people really like logistic regression, and that seems to be really popular as well. But uh, random forest is like a non-parametric method, and so if you have missing data, you can sort of code it as missing, and it's not sort of sensitive to like the distribution of the of the underlying uh, covariates and stuff. So it's, I I, per, I like it a lot actually. I use it all the time in everything that I do. Um, let's see. So the estimated probabilities are called the propensity scores. All right. Then there's the prognostic scores. So somewhat similar to the propensity score, but they have a few differences. Um, so I'm just going to talk about. Why would we use them first? Okay, so suppose we have a subject TI, and this is exactly like before. Uh, we have a subject CJ, and then they have a response uh, G of them. Then we have uh, that they both have the same prognostic score, right? And uh, if there's no confounding variables, then we have the same sort of situation as before, which is that their average difference is an unbiased estimate of their of the, of the treatment, which is great because that's what we we're trying to measure. So we're going to put the propensity scores and the prognostic scores together to hopefully reduce the bias in the estimates that we would see if we were, or for example, only using propensity scores. Or sorry, variance. Because if you just match on one of those numbers, you tend to have a tendency to have more variance in your estimate. So we put them together to get a sort of a, a tighter confidence interval. OK, so how to calculate a prognostic score. So this is, this is a really important part, because I didn't know this before I started looking into um, why we would want to use them. So rather than use both the treatment and the control subjects to build a model, like we would in the propensity scores, we want to use only the control group to build a model that predicts the grade. So basically, it's a function that, based on their covariates, things we can measure about them, uh, what do we expect to see their final grades be? That's, that's the idea. And so. Um, we use that same model to predict the grade that the people in the treatment group are going to get. So based on their covariates, what do we think they're supposed to get? And then together, the estimated um, grades based on the model for the control group and the predictions, are all those, all those together are called the prognostic scores. OK, so information that's used by the propensity score and the prognostic score is listed up above. And so the propensity score has a tendency to favor information about the learning styles and the gender of the student and the number of office hours they expect to attend and like the time expected to spend studying for the class as a way of gauging whether or not someone's likely going to be an e-coach user at some level. And then the prognostic scores have a tendency to favor the goal grade and their student's confidence and the GPA as a way to figure out what they're going to get 
for a grade in the class. So they, the two numbers are sort of using the same information but differently, so which is why I think it's nice to use both of them together for these estimated treatment effects estimates. You don't have these for the people who did Register. Register. We, we don't, don't have information about like, then what's used for. Oh, you do have the learning styles. So yeah, so the learning styles is, is available to, to both groups. The, the, the gender of the students available to this both both groups. Um, let's see. Yeah, GPA is available. Um, so so that's what I was saying before is like the matches tend to be better when you have a full data set, and the students that didn't use eCoach, um, they're 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 sort of susceptible to bias more so than you would see with uh, within user comparisons. Do you have a sense of how much more bias? Well, I have some slides in a little while. Perfect. Yeah. OK, so, so we're trying to get a good match here. So after we compute the prognostic and the propensity scores, uh, every observation has basically this ordered pair now of prognostic score and propensity score. So then we use the R package, um, OptMatch, to create a full matching between the members of the treatment and the control group. And then we have a problem, right, possibly. So propensity scores are on this, on this level from 0 to 1. And our prognostic scores are basically between 65 and 97. And so when we think of distance, basically we think that if, if you just do a Euclidean sort of proximity matching, you're going to basically ignore the propensity score. So we have to deal with this in some way. Uh, so, we can, so we need to put them basically on the same scale. Right? So in some sense, we're going to standardize uh, the, two, the two variables. So we're going to use something called the Hal Lenovus distance. Um, which I'll have the definition up in just a, just a minute of what that actually is. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in, when you're having um, to estimate distances between, uh, between points, and either there's like some correlation issues, or maybe that they're on different scales. You want to sort of like adjust that so that you put everything on the same scale. OK. So here's the definition of the Mahalanobis distance. And it basically uses the covariance matrix to sort of adjust. and. Um, uh, bring the two things that you're trying to measure that are, are both on different scales onto the same scale. Okay, so in our case, X1 and X2 here are the prognostic score and the propensity score. Any questions about this? Okay, good. Stuart would set up there'll be a task afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to grade it? <laughs> okay, so... Uh, how highly correlated are these? Not too much. I mean, there's some correlation. I, I can't remember the exact number. I want to say like 0.3 or something like that, but I don't really remember it off the top of my head. I have to check on that and get back to you. But that's a good question, actually. We should say something about this. Yeah. OK, so um, as far as saving the dissimilarity, the distance information, so um, it's, it's saved in something called a, a dissimilarity matrix. Um, typic, but the thing is, is that when you look up the definition of dissimilarity matrix, uh, if you like look it up on Wikipedia, it's not, it's not the dissimilarity matrix that uh, OptMatch uses. And so this is actually a structure where we have only treatment and control elements, um, treatments on the col in the rows and control units on the columns. And so wherever you find an intersection of a particular two individuals that are in treatment and control, that entry is going to be their dissimilarity. Saving the information like this actually is much more computationally friendly than saving like this giant dissimilarity matrix. And so this is why I just wanted to kind of like mention that this is the what the dissimilarity matrix that we're using for uh, matching is actually this one, not the one that you would read about if you just like, you know, wiki uh, dissimilarity matrix. Okay. So once you have the dissimilarity matrix, uh, which, which is actually built in the package full match, um, it, uh, it basically matches the individuals, right? And so uh, an informal definition of what a full match is, is I'm basically going to quote uh, uh, Hansen's, one of Hansen's papers. So it's a matching method whereby a sample of, is subdivided into a collection of match sets. So here's the key. It consists either of a treated subject, so just one treated subject, and any positive number of controls. So you know, one to you know, infinity, basically, is th theoretically possible. And then or. A particular match set will have only one control subject and any positive number of, of uh, treatment persons. So uh, you can t see sometimes like one to one, lots of one to one matches, lots of one to two matches, lots of uh, two to one matches, and three to ones, and maybe even five to ones. And uh, the nice the nice thing about this is that for distributions that have a tendency to be shifted, and there's like problems matching people on the tails, this can sort of like handle that problem in a really nice way which is why I think this matching method is actually um, really clever at uh, sort of dealing with um, observational study problems that come up like that. So 
So one of the characteristics, I, I like this quote a lot actually, so among matching the techniques for observational studies, which is what we're doing, uh, full matching is in principle the best um, in the sense that its alignment of comparable treated and control subjects is as good as any alternative method. So if you're going to match in any other way, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But uh, this will at least do as well as that or possibly better, So, which is why it's sort of like robust to the mistakes that you might make or biases that you might introduce uh, either from recycling data or maybe from uh, um, d deciding beforehand how you were going to match people. Oh, and the, the reference for how the matching method actually works is at the bottom of the slide. So if you guys want to read about it later, you can. OK. Drum roll. Results. So here are the results. Did, did I get the part about? Oh yes. Oh, yeah. This is this, these results are for the eco registered students only. The next slide is for the ones where we compare the non-registered students. Yes. Okay. So those are the results. Um, the top portion has uh, the fall results, and the bottom portion has the winter results. And so we have um, the comparison column, which is. Ooh. This column right here. And then sample sizes are right here. And then sometimes we can't find a perfect match. And so those people who are not matchable, basically we, we list who gets dropped from the matching, the, the numbers that get matched right there. And here we have the actual estimates, along with the 95% confidence interval here. And so um, let's see. If, so if you see uh, an estimated difference that has a double, a double star, that's just an indication that uh, using both the propensity score and the prognostic score uh, was not as good as using only the propensity score. So these double star ones, this one used only the propensity score for matching, and this one used only the propensity score for matching, but the other ones used the propensity and the prognostic score for matching. What are the uh, units of the differences? The, out of 100%, so for example, um, somebody who would have gotten like an, an 80 in the, low, in the high group here, uh, their, their counterpart would have gotten 2.89 points lower. Yeah, so it's like the difference in the grades, in like the pair differences. Yeah. So then uh, we compare the non-registered students with the registered students. And these particular estimates all use the combination propensity slash prognostic score match. And so we can see the differences. The, the table layout is exactly the same. And so here are the estimated differences. And here are the confidence intervals. So basically, um, what we see, I think, that's most notable in this, in this uh, table is that whenever there's a low user to a non-user comparison, both in winter and fall terms, um, there's basically no difference between the two, the two groups because their, their confidence intervals are you know, pretty well set over zero. So we can't really see the difference if there is one, at least with the data that we have. Um, any questions about this? Or the previous slide. Could you try and slice and dice even more? Because I mean, you got signal noise and burn, right? So in principle, you could bend the high users much more finely and go for like the Uber users who look at every five minutes. We we could do that. Yeah, we have we have not done that yet. So um, initially, I was more worried about um, uh, the size of the signal not being big enough to see the difference. We don't have to worry about that now. But that's right. Now we don't have to worry about that. That's right. So, um, so yes, but not yet. Oh, not yet uh, formally. That's what I would say. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's a pictorial representation of the high users compared to the rest of the groups. So the left side. This is fall term, and then this is the winter term, and we have uh, high to non, high to low, and high to mid. And so um, it looks like. Oops, sorry about that. It looks like the, so the confidence intervals, I know that the winter term seems to like estimate on average higher than the fall term. But the thing is, is that they're in, the confidence intervals are pretty well overlapped. And so um, I, I'm not necessarily comfortable saying that like the winter term has better estimates, better effects than the fall term, because you know, the range of variability is sort of squarely you know, shared. So um, I think the takeaway is that high users compared to non-users, they tend to do much better. Um, same thing with the high versus low users. And then the high and mid users, they have a, the high users compared to the mid users tend to do better. Uh, maybe about a point, maybe, maybe two points. OK, so here's the example that we came up with. So we have Samantha, right? She's an average student. 
uh, right, she exists in two universes, right? Because we have to, we want to observe uh, the non-user and the observed and the user simultaneously, which is difficult. So in universe one, she's taking stats 250 in the winter term, but there's no e-coach. Oh, no e-coach. Jared, what happened? <laughs> I must have started grad school. <laughs> Um, and then in Universe 2, she's also taking Stats 250, but eCoach actually exists, and she's really excited about getting messages from Dr. Gunderson and reading the other students' testimonials. So her usage ratio is 0.85, so she reads almost everything, right? So in Universe 1, her expected grade was about 89.4, which is an A-, minus, pretty good, right? But not if you want to get into med school. <laughs> and then Universe 2, uh, she actually read those messages, recall? So her actual expected grade is 4.62 points actually higher than Universe 1 where there was no e-coach. And so she's likely going to get an A unless, you know, she sort of steps off the gas. Better to be in Universe 2. I think. Yes. So some wonderful results from our fall and winter term. Uh, spring term, we didn't have eCoach. It wasn't going to be available during the spring semester. And we have a smaller class then. So Patricia enters the picture, uh, our behavioral expert that added to the team. But she came to me and wanted to look into investigating an intervention that she has in mind about getting the students to choose strategically among all those different class resources that they have and put that into a plan, an actual plan that they could follow through with. And so we did an experiment in the spring term, doing surveys before and after the exams, and only had about 137 that actually participated in the study. But we did find a significant improvement in those who were in the treated group, where they were guided to do that strategic planning and um, organizing of their resources compared to the control group. And so this led to wanting to investigate this with this strong of effect that we saw in the spring term and a small sample size into the fall term and it's in our Easy Coach and just released our first message this term. So spring term, no eCoach, but an interesting experiment that really ties into what we're trying to do in eCoach in terms of that personalization and getting them to take charge and getting that information of where they're at and putting into a plan what they want to use. So fall term, what are we doing right now? We have Easy Coach, and it is a little easier. I'm actually doing some of the programming. I'm doing my own Get Things Done list every week. Um, it is a better platform. It certainly has helped to counteract that learning curve in that Michigan tailoring system workbench that was needed to be used. Um, we'll also allow for a lot more collaboration in terms of being able to take a message template and be able to use it and tweak it and not have to restart the whole wheel from scratch and understand all that coding and logic that's behind it all, that you need wonderful grad students that can do that for you. Um, this is a look at what the Easy Coach looks like right now, just a few days ago. Uh, we also are in that Canvas pilot, so that's a new thing that's in our course this fall term. But we have a link to eCoach right at the bottom there. A homepage always takes them to all the places that they might need to go from within our course. So that is there. And we are bringing in this expanded experiment to further investigate this idea of the strategic planning that we can guide our students to do. And so they just received a prep message for this exam coming up next week, a few days ago, and also available in the eCoach for all students, not just those who signed up. The survey that will be our pre-exam survey, getting them to go through this process of thinking in a guided way, and then we do a post-exam survey, and we'll continue with that for the three exams that we have this term to really see the impact and what part of this strategic planning is really doing the work. So that's where we're at right now. I thought I would end with the field guide to data science. Uh, there's a lot of guides that were there. I need my glasses. Thank you. A lot of guides gave their idea of what data science is all about. And here is Stephen who said, data science is like life. It's not linear. It's complex. It can be beautiful, but it requires the support of your friends and colleagues. And yes, you do need a team. And again, I thank my team members, the wonderful grad students that we had to work with, and all those that were supporting the efforts we were doing through eCoach. It was Peter who said, it's most fascinating blend of art and math and code and sweat and tears. And there were some sweating and not tears so much, but some late night chats of rendering that message and making sure it was doing what it was supposed to do before we released it to the students the next day and getting everything done. So there was a lot of work together and 
art to make it look right for the students' perspective and, and the coding that was done, so a lot of that. Brought us to some high highs, most recently with this better analysis that we've been bringing and sharing with you, but also some lows in there too. And finally, don't forget to play. Don't forget to play with your data and play with your algorithms and you might just discover something that will help you solve that question, that problem. And we have our resident player right here who's been playing with that data for us. We have a slide which has a lot of references that will be in the slide deck for you and we wanted to say thank you for listening to our story and ask, certainly entertain any questions that you might have at this point. Um, let's see, I'll just, okay, I think your hand was up first. Can I ask you why you uh, picked learning styles? Um, so, it, so Jackie Miller, she's a lecturer here also uh, in statistics, and she was kind of mentioning, because we were trying to find things that, that were relevant in terms of uh, what sorts of things could we measure that would affect someone's performance in a class or, you know, just to, what can you use to get an idea about who the students are? And she mentioned it, and we weren't sure if it was going to be helpful or not. Um, and it ended up being really useful. So it was purely by chance that we just decided to give them the survey to see if it was relevant in terms of our estimates. And I didn't see in your data that it was really useful. You oh, the propensity score matching. Mm -hmm. It's important for that. So deciding who's likely to be a UCoach user has, has a lot to do with what their learning style. When that was not in the analysis, the propensity score was uh, less effective than when it was in the analysis? Oh, it's, it's always in the analysis, because we, we did it for fall and winter terms. And we had all students do it. Yeah, and all students used it. So was it related to grades? Uh, just a little bit, just a tiny little bit. It's, it's more related to their likeness, like likelihood of using eCoach than it is not. So basically, uh, if you want to see how effective eCoach is, you want to figure out who's likely to use it and compare to people who are equally likely to use it. And then you look at their, their grade difference, if they did use it or not. You can get an idea there. If, um, how much so you would be open to other variables that might be more highly related to Completely. Mm -hmm. You have other variables in mind? Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, I think at the very back, the glasses. Thank oh. you for that great presentation. And Brenda, I appreciate the careful way you walked us through your use of each coach. I don't know, the equally careful way you walked us through your analysis. Um, I have a question about next steps, though, and that eCoach has a lot of moving parts. So I'm wondering if there are any plans to see which parts, though, have more impact on student outcomes. <laughs> Who wants to answer this? I feel like Pat Patricia would want to answer this question. Or Jared. I don't know. <laughs> I understand that mm -hmm. um, First of all, you know, the SLAM series has been sort of my growing up with this whole process. And what I observe is that there's a lot of people engaged with this and getting them to work together is going to be part of the part of the whether or not we're able to isolate some of these moving parts. And so, um, one one reason that that's, that's hopeful that we can do that I think, is that the new Easy Coach platform or whatever we use as we move closer in this direction um, will be making it making it um, making it possible for an individual researcher who wants to study one moving part to deploy that one moving part in many places. And so the instructor's role will be more about deciding, you know, what moving parts do we want to put into the course this term and and then, you know, how we how we do that between courses and you know, and who takes responsibility for managing the one moving part of the mm -hmm. is a thing that I think is gonna engage a lot of people and people working together. Thank you, Jared. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, the back. Uh, yes, I have a couple of questions that could be related to each panel. The first one is, um, so does the system use any group information when it creates uh, personalized uh, messages? For example, some messages like uh, your activity level is higher than 80% of other people. Uh, and the second question to be related to that is, if the answer is yes, so what is the requirement of um, number of enrollment uh, of enrollment students to be able to use uh, e coach? For example, I have a class of ten students. Is that possible to use that? 
So as far as the system using information of the group, I think the answer is not yet, or, because we, we had had this conversation before, but we, it's really, I think it's really hard to do that, at least at the, level, the, state, the state that we're at now. Jared, I don't know, you maybe want to answer this question too, because he's, he's really like the, the system person. Let's or has, about it afterwards. Okay. <laughs> And so, but as far as like the number of people, that would, I don't know, it, it sort of depends how, how homogeneous that group is and how, how much of a reliable estimate you can get from the, the collection of uh, whatever you're measuring. Yeah. Yes? Brad, you, you said in passing that when you took uh, this information about the learning styles and that helped you design how you altered your feedback. Can you give examples? I'm curious how you did. Oh, in our exam one prep message, the following year when we had the learning styles at the beginning, mm -hmm. we took what was general guidance of what those learning styles mean in terms of what they like to do for engaging with material and created that to be more on the stats side for getting ready for the exam. So we just tweaked the advice we had from the paper to be more stats specific related and gave them, so try that problem roulette or you might be better at drawing the picture of the distribution or things like that that were more specific. Or you might like talking about the, how to do these problems out loud right. with your friends you might, or something. Yeah, you might be better with the group or might go to the office hour and, and talk with other students. Just some things that tended to be matching with what type of learner they indicated they were. I wonder, did you do any demographic breakdown of the high users versus the medium users with low users in terms of gender, race, whether or not they you know, thought they were going to get an A if they were more high users versus C students who thought I can't do anything anyway in stats, so I'm not going to use it. I'm just so that kind of stuff is in our, the summary statistics. So we're working on a paper for all of this stuff right now. And so um, the summary statistics sort of like reveal some of that stuff. So as far as like, like hardcore analysis, it's like at this level, um, not like this, but more just like descriptive Descript stuff. Because it's an idea about who the users are and stuff like that. Um, so you said that the degree of tailoring in the okay. A-B testing didn't show a significant impact on grade. Do, did you see any impact on usage? Were more people in the low usage category also low tailored messages? That was fairly balanced, wasn't it? Um, so it seems like the people that get the high tailored messages like to use it a little bit more. But the thing is, is that those differences were only in, in the directional in terms of like, uh, but as far as like, being certain that the estimate is like positive or whatever, that part is not, we weren't able to do that. Gotcha. Yeah, so I think um, if we were to do this probably for maybe like three semesters, high, low, high versus low, we might have enough data at that point to get a, a good estimate, if, if the numbers stayed the same. Right. Yeah, I think there was one more ago. Yeah. Oh, who's, who's next? Yeah. <laughs> I just wondering how much is uh, faculty involvement in order to get this to uh, going? Like, uh, how much is done by machine, like by the intelligence part, and how much is done by GSAs and students? <laughs> um, and also, <coughs> how much is, um, do you, after using e coach, do you feel like your teaching style has been changed? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, first of all. Most of the content message writing was done by faculty, by m myself, in terms of starting that draft out. We had the graduate students, a team of, you know, what, three, four, five at a time that were ever working on it that would be the ones to get it into the system coded. I would mark out, you know, what logic I wanted for this part of the message should say this here, if they did this well, if they had a low homework score, it should say this guided message here, so I would parse that up. That's where I'm still learning and would like to know that I could do better at that tailoring idea. But need those graduate students who are willing to meet with you weekly and a couple times and chat with you at 11.30 at night to right. make sure that message is ready to go. Um, as far as what was exciting for me is that a lot of what I would like to do with a student one-on-one, -on -one, I was able to have the system do with that student, even though I wasn't able to sit down with them directly. So these were all things that I would like to do and still would like to do individually when I can, and they do come in to see me, but at least now it was getting out to more of my students. Um, and just a system that would, in a nice package, provide the Get Things Done list, would provide some of the tools that I would have, but maybe there were more pieces that the students didn't see could really be part of their learning environment being put together. But I don't know if it's necessarily changed my style of teaching in any way. 
but to promote the e-coach and know that it is something that I think can students can find a useful part of it and help it right, in their learning. Do you think you're representative of the faculty in terms of how much it innovated your teaching? I mean, you're an Apple Award winning teacher mm -hmm. from way back. Way back. But, I mean, do you have a sense? I'm just willing to stay up till 11.30 or 12 or 1 and, <laughs> and work on things that have to be done for that next day. And I, I love my graduate students and know that they have such a valuable piece to incorporate and find these awesome, amazing people that have these ideas and jump on that wagon. So, so, so I'll try to answer your question by saying there is a decay constant that, that, is, <laughs> that is in effect. And so it's becoming easier, fewer people require yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, and Brenda is definitely, you know, having worked with a few faculty, she's on the most engaged <laughs> side of the system. <laughs> Brenda, you make us all look bad. <laughs> but I guess, I guess the follow-up that I'd have is the extent to which if one was to use this in a number of different classes that have similar ecosystems but in the same department. Right? So, for example, all mm -hmm. introductory physics classes or all introductory astronomy mm -hmm. classes. I imagine getting you over the hump for the first one is horrifying. Yeah. But then once you're over the hump, I would have thought that, the, yeah. that you could have a particularly enthusiastic person kind of do everything for all the classes. And then, <laughs> and, but then the instructors of those classes might keep it made and smoke relatively mm -hmm. straightforwardly without that much effort. Is that a reasonable assertion? I think so as to what we're moving towards. And once you have, I mean, fall to winter, I mean, winter you had a basis and we could still do the tweaking. And now I'm able to even go in and do some of the actual tweaking versus asking my grad student to go in and do the coding on the back end. So the, the delay is it's much more immediate. And the transporting of what I'm seeing in biology or chemistry do and say, oh, I like that. And I can bring it in and still change it fairly easily because it's a module that can be shared. Right. Mm -hmm. well, one of the big shifts from the biggest difference, the biggest visible difference between the, the, the old system and the easy coach system is the capacity of the system to handle moving from one semester to the next without loss of uh, loss of the effort that happened previously. So, so there, there's still a fair amount of, um, of benefit to having some coding experience or having a graduate student that can do the coding and you know, implement your, your plan, but uh, carrying things So I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but let's thank Brenda and Omar.